Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this week's Levy Lecture. Um, our virtual guest today is Michelle Nichols, who is a um, who's worked at the Adler Planetarium for 25 years in educational programming and um, and other things. And she is uh, excited to share her slides of uh, slides from the Hubble telescope and, and talk to us about the upcoming projects. This is going to be an out of the world performance uh, presentation. Um, no pun intended. It's going to be great. I have a few housekeeping announcements. Um, <clears throat> if I forgot to say so in the beginning, I'm Wendy Cromash. I'm on the board of the Levy Senior Center Foundation. Uh, the foundation is the one who has organized and supported all of these um, webinars, and uh, it's a great organization. It's a 5013C. Um, please keep us in mind as you make your charitable donations this year. Um, secondly, we'd like to sp um, give a big thank you to our corporate sponsor, Avidor Evanston for their support. Um, their generosity has allowed us to uh, continue these webinars um, as frequently as we're doing, and um, that would not be possible without them. Um, Avidor Evanston, it's a brand new building. It opened in June. Um, it's they say it's stress-free living in downtown Evanston. And um, I just will add a personal note here that I went to visit Avidor and walk through, um, see the facilities, and I wanted to move in. Um, it's beautiful. It is absolutely stunning. The rooms are nicely um, proportioned, modern appliances. It's restful. Um, There's so many amenities. Um, so I, I recommend that if you're thinking about downsizing, getting rid of your house, please um, consider Avidor as one of those, one of your options. Um, if you're interested for a tour, call them 847-512-4232. Um, okay some housekeeping uh, details. Your microphones are muted. Uh, we will be, um, we want to hear from you, so please use the Q&A function. And um, especially uh, toward the end, if you have questions that you'd like to ask Michelle, type them out using Q&A and I will uh, relay them to her. Don't use the hand function, please. Um, I don't have that. I don't have accessibility to that, and um, it'll be frustrating for both of us because you'll be upset that I'm not responding, and I'll be upset because I can't. So just use Q&A. Um, let's see. There'll be a short feedback survey at the end. Uh, kindly complete and return it. Um, if you have any other questions or comments, my email is... Uh, readily available, I believe, on the invitation. So um, please don't hesitate to get in touch with me. Um, I also wanted to recommend today in the morning was a nice day for a long sleeve EB Levy Senior Center Foundation t-shirt, 100% cotton, very, very comfortable and cozy. And they're only $15. So if you're interested in a t-shirt, let me know. I will make sure that you get it either by dropping it off personally or mailing it to you. Um, and without further ado, I am going to turn it off to the astro educator, Michelle Nichols. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
Um, so welcome everyone. I'm looking at the participant numbers and there are almost 300 of you signed on today and I suspect possibly uh, uh, where you are there may be even more than one person on your end. So welcome to all of you. This literally is the largest webinar I have ever done in terms of number of people. Um, so thank you for allowing me into your homes virtually. Uh, my name is Michelle Nichols. I'm the Director of Public Observing at the Adler Planetarium in Chicago. Um, as Wendy said, I've been there for 25 years and I'm in charge of all of Adler's sky observing and telescope observing initiatives. And um, as you may or may not know, the Adler is closed and we've been closed since March 14th. Um, Got to keep everybody safe and we're doing our part. Uh, we're going to be closed until phase five of the Restore Illinois um, coronavirus, coronavirus response plan. So it'll be a little while before we've got folks uh, within our doors. But in the meantime, um, I'm, I'm hoping you will enjoy this presentation. I do these presentations outside of my job. Uh, this isn't actually part of my job because this actually gives me the freedom to talk about stuff that I find really interesting. And this particular talk has been on my roster of presentations. It's the very first one that I ever did uh, for a library over 20 years ago. And I can't get rid of it uh, because everybody just finds the Hubble Space Telescope so interesting, or at least they tell me that it is. And it's usually one of my most well attended talks. By the way, sorry, I forgot one thing. Um, I'm doing this from my house. Um, I have two cats sitting right here, and if they decide to not sleep, they might start walking across in front of uh, the camera and on my computer keyboard. Forgive me in advance if that happens. <laughs> so I need to then attend to moving a cat out of the way. So um, anyway, I hope you don't mind. <laughs> I hope you don't see them. Um, they are contentedly sleeping over here right now, so let's just hope they stay that way. Um, anyway. Getting back to this presentation, um, uh, it's it's been the most popular one, and it's it's amazing to me that it, that number one, the telescope has lasted this long. Um, it has been up in space for just over thirty years, um, and that people have heard of it and that you've probably seen pictures or at least one um, picture from it. And so I'm going to center this presentation about how the Hubble Space Telescope has changed astronomy as a whole. Now, one thing I usually try to do as a beginning part of just about all my presentations is to just go over some base terminology just so we're on the same page. The nice thing about this presentation is if you are not interested one bit about astronomy, just let the pretty pictures wash all over you. That's what I love about Hubble. The pictures are astonishing. Um, and so if you want to just contemplate the amazing beauty of these pictures, that's cool. I have no problem with that at all. Um, if you want to learn a little astronomy along the way, that's great too. Um, I just want to go over some, some terminology so that we're all on the same page, so, so that when I mention uh, some things or some objects that we kind of have an idea of what I'm talking about. Number one, solar system. So our solar system is composed of our star, one star, the sun, that's our sun's name, sun, um, or sol, S-O-L, sol, and that's where we get the word solar from. It's the solar system, the system of stuff that goes around sol and sol. Um, and so we have one star, our sun, and a system of stuff that goes around it, planets orbit the sun, moons orbit planets or satellites. Um, and then when you get out a little farther, our solar system is part of a much larger collection of, of stars and other stuff called a galaxy. Galaxies can be small. They can contain 10,000 stars. Galaxies can be gigantic. They can contain over a trillion stars. That's trillion with a T. Um, and then our galaxies are all part of the collection that we call the universe. That's the, the stuff we can see out there. Um, so solar system is where we are, one star, our sun, with everything else that goes around it, um, part of the much larger galaxy, in this case called the Milky Way, um, and then we are part, part of a much larger collection uh, called the universe. Now you will, you will also hear me use the word nebula from time to time. A nebula 
is it's a Latin word that means cloud or basically fuzzy thing. Um, when astronomers of old saw fuzzy things up in the sky, they didn't know what they were. They knew they looked different from the stars, which were just little pinpoints. And they, they did different things. The planets moved differently. They didn't quite know what those were either, uh, but they seemed to move differently from the stars. Nebula just means fuzzy thing. And so the word nebula got attached to a whole lot of different things which we then come to find out are different, but the name nebula stuck. So you'll see me and hear me use the word nebula, even though it can refer to vastly different objects, vastly different sizes of objects, vastly different types of objects. Um, but just know that the word nebula means cloud or fuzzy thing, all right? We use Latin a lot in astronomy, Latin, Greek, Arabic, um, all sorts of different languages are incorporated into uh, astronomy as a whole. So now that we've got that, um, uh, that baseline of, of words, Let's get into the presentation because I want to give you a little history of the Hubble Space Telescope. Had a little bit of a checkered past, um, which with redemption, it would make a great movie. Um, and then uh, we get we dive right into the pictures because I know that's why we're all here, right? All right, so I'm going to share my screen. So give me just a sec. There we go. All right. Okay. So. Um, I'm showing you a picture. This is not Edwin Hubble. This is Lyman Spitzer. So Edwin Hubble was an astronomer who, um, I won't get, get into everything that he did. He was at the University of Chicago. He figured out that um, uh, that our, our universe is made of galaxies and they are moving away from each other. There are various people who worked on that topic as well. And so Lyman Spitzer, in 1946, he was working for the RAND Corporation, and he wrote a paper um, to basically put forth the benefits of putting a telescope into space. Uh, essentially, when you get a telescope up above our atmosphere, our atmosphere will blur your images. And so if you get above the air, uh, that would be great for your telescope. You wouldn't need to put a giant one up in space because a smaller one can do an even better job than a big one down on the ground. And so note that 1946 is still well before the start of the space age, uh, which didn't start for the United States until 1958. So even though we didn't have the capacity to put telescopes up in space at that point, astronomers knew that doing so would benefit them greatly. Um, this picture was not taken in 1946, but uh, it was in 1946 that Lyman Spitzer had written this paper. Now, the Hubble Space Telescope and the Space Shuttle grew up at the same time. They were designed and built at exactly the same time. The primary mirror of the Hubble Space Telescope was built by a company that uh, at the time was called Perkin Elmer Corporation. They were located in Connecticut. Take a look at the size of the mirror. Now, if you think about telescopes, um, they either are made of lenses, glass lenses, or mirrors, or both. Uh, in this case, it's a mirror. But notice the size of the person sitting next to the mirror. Uh, it's not that big. Um, this, this mirror is less than 10 feet across. And so what's amazing is you put a less than 10 foot wide mirror up in space. It is still better than the largest telescopes we currently have on the ground. Now they are rapidly approaching Hubble's capabilities. Um, but they're not quite there yet. So it's it's fascinating that, that a telescope of this size can still outdo telescopes that are much, much bigger. It, that blurring effect of the Earth's atmosphere is considerable. So this picture was taken in 1985. You can get a sense of the size of the telescope. It's about 40 feet long. Um, again, the that main mirror um, actually sits in about this part. I think you can see my cursor, um, about the middle part. Of the uh, of the telescope, everything on the back end is um, instruments and uh, the the inner guts of the telescope, the computers and all sorts of stuff like that. Um, but it's not a gigantic telescope. Why? It needed to fit within the payload bay of the space shuttle. I mentioned that the space shuttle and Hubble grew up at the same time. The Hubble was designed to be launched and serviced by astronauts on the space shuttle. So this is a picture of Hubble's launch. The uh, launch was delayed 
Um, it, it should have been around 1986 or so, and that was delayed by the Challenger tragedy. But the launch was April 24th of 1990, and um, this was uh, the Space Shuttle Discovery. And you can see there's another, another Space Shuttle on the nearby launch pad in this picture, and that was at the time the Space Shuttle Columbia waiting for its launch later on that year. Just one day later, April 25th, 1990, uh, the astronauts used the robotic arm of the space shuttle to grab onto the telescope, which it was built to do that. And uh, they essentially just took the telescope off the side of the space shuttle. It's already in orbit. It's already going fast enough to stay in orbit. Um, it was about it's about 300 miles up or so. Um, so this uh, this was literally just take the take the telescope off the side and let go. And it is in orbit. You don't need rockets or anything to stay. Well, you do eventually uh, fall out of orbit, but we don't need to fire rockets continuously to stay in orbit. Once you get going, um, you're going to be in orbit until something causes you to not be in orbit anymore. But the, the, um, the Hubble Space Telescope has been flying ever since. Unfortunately, um, when the Hubble was built, when its mirror was ground, I showed you that picture of the mirror actually being ground. Uh, when the mirror was created, there were some uh, instruments that were used to figure out the shape of the mirror. And you need mirrors to be precisely figured in order for them to work properly and to focus the light in the way that you that you want. The mirror was, uh, the calibration instruments that they used with the mirror, um, they were not themselves calibrated correctly. One of them was and one of them was not. And the scientists or the uh, engineers at the time unfortunately trusted the readings of the one that was not calibrated correctly. So the mirror on the edge was ground 1 50th of the width of a human hair. Uh, in, in its flaw. That's all it took. What it meant was the telescope did not focus light, all the light that it could, and, and give quite the precise uh, imagery that it wanted. However, take a look at this picture. The picture on the, on the left is a ground-based image of Pluto and its largest moon, Charon. The picture on the right is the non-fixed, the launched Hubble Space Telescope. Even with the flaw, it was still better than anything we had on the ground. Um, but if you notice, there are these rings of light. That's the problem. It means the, the, if there are those rings of light, it means the telescope is not focusing all the light that it could, concentrating it as much as it could. So while it was great and better than anything on the ground, what the story that, that got out was, oh, Hubble is broken. Um, it really wasn't. Um, and so what NASA decided to do was take the next few years and figure out exactly the, the nature of the flaw. And so in 1993, uh, the Space Shuttle Endeavor was launched to essentially correct Hubble's flaw. And they installed, uh, astronauts on a, on a spacewalk installed a, um, uh, a set of instrumentation called COSTAR, the Corrective Optics Space Telescope Axial Replacement. NASA loves an, a good acronym. Um, and so it contained optics within this instrument to correct the mirror's flaw. Um, there was another instrument called the Wide Field Planetary Camera that was also replaced, and it contained its own optics to fix the flaw. This is COSTAR right here. Um, uh, this is the wide field planetary camera right here. And this one is COSTAR, kind of looks like a, a large fridge. And so these two instruments contained their own optics to correct for the flaw. NASA did not remove the bad mirror and put in a new one. They added instrumentation that could correct for the flaw because they were able to characterize it so well. So just to give you a sense of the capabilities, the picture here is a galaxy. Um, a spiral galaxy. A spiral just means it's a pinwheel shape. Um, and it, this was a ground-based image taken by the largest, at the time, the largest ground-based telescope, which was Mount Palomar. 
um, and this galaxy is called M100. And so if you take a look at the next set of pictures, the picture on the left, the, the far most left picture, is the uncorrected Hubble telescope image. I'm going to go back, take a look at this picture, and take a look at this one. It's still good. It's still really good, but NASA said, you know, we could do better. The picture in the middle is the same galaxy, but with the corrected uh, CoStar and wide field planetary camera optics. Um, and then the picture on the uh, far right is the same galaxy, but the this this camera was replaced in um, uh, a little over 10 years ago. And so it was replaced with an even better one. You can absolutely make the argument that the Hubble Space Telescope is better now than it was even when it was launched and even when it was fixed in 1993. So we have a much more capable telescope because instrumentation has been improved over the years. And that's because the space shuttle gave us the opportunity to do that. You can make the argument, you can state your case that Hubble is the most influential telescope in history. And I kind of gave you the punchline to that. Um, how is it the most influential telescope in history? You've actually heard of it. Uh, name, name three other telescopes. Unless you're really deep into astronomy, it might be pretty hard to do that. Um, you might have heard of the Yerkes Observatory up in Williams Bay, Wisconsin. You might have heard of Mount Palomar. Um, you might have heard of, of another one, the Keck telescopes out in Hawaii. Um, but uh, unless you're into astronomy, you probably haven't heard of those. And so um, just the sheer fact that they've gotten the word out about Hubble, its pictures are amazing, and they make the news. Um, so it's it's from a public standpoint, it is definitely highly uh, influential. Now, how Hubble has changed the science of astronomy, I'm going to go through several ways that it has. First off, it has allowed us to keep an eye on the neighbors. Now, what I do not mean by that is Hubble is not looking at you on the ground. It is not keeping an eye on, on the newspaper that you're reading as you're sitting outside drinking your coffee. What I mean by that is it can help us keep an eye on our own solar system. Uh, just a few months ago, there was a comet, which is essentially a dirty snowball in space or a snowy dirt ball. And it was given the name Comet Atlas. It was named for the telescope that, that discovered it. And Comet Atlas was getting closer to the sun. And then all of a sudden, Comet Atlas got really unstable and, and broke apart into about two dozen pieces. Um, this happens a lot with comets. It's not unusual. But what Hubble has allowed us to do is really watch this disintegration happen. I mean, you can see changes from one picture to the next. Just three days later, uh, they were able to take some pictures and go, wow, this thing really has come apart into more than two dozen pieces. So it gives us a chance to, to watch these things when we don't have a spacecraft going to a comet in time to be able to uh, observe it um, up close. Just look at how magnificent this picture of Saturn is. We don't currently have a telescope at Saturn, um, but or a, or a spacecraft at Saturn. But um, from afar, we can keep an eye on Saturn and storms in its atmosphere and all sorts of stuff. This picture was taken in 2018, and this picture was taken in 2020. I'm going to toggle back and forth between the two. Notice Saturn looks different from one set of pictures to the next. We can watch these seasonal changes. And um, right now, uh, Saturn is in northern hemisphere summer. Um, its northern hemisphere has kind of a reddish haze. Its southern hemisphere has kind of a bluish haze. Those are real colors. Um, it's not as colorful as Jupiter is, but um, the, these changes are important for astronomers to, to keep an eye on. By the way, these two little dots, these are not stars. These are two of the moons of Saturn. And uh, this one is called Mimas, the one on the right. And this one, the one on the bottom, is called Enceladus. In 1994, uh, the Hubble Space Telescope and others allowed us to watch as Jupiter was struck by about 30 fragments from a comet, Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9. And it was the first time a comet had been seen hitting a planet. Thankfully, not hitting our own planet. We're very glad that 
that Jupiter is kind of our cosmic vacuum cleaner and uh, stuff is more likely to hit Jupiter than it is to hit us because Jupiter is just that much bigger than we are. Um, this has happened many times in the early histi history of our solar system, but does not happen too often these days. So uh, again, that's a good thing, um, but it allowed us to watch this from afar just to give you a sense of scale. This object right here, this is called the, the, the um, Great Red Spot. It's not very great, it's not very red, uh, but this is about twice the size of Earth, or at least when this picture was taken, it was, it's gotten a little smaller over the years. So notice if this is about twice the size of Earth, notice the sizes of these dark splotches. These are the, the aftermath of the comet hitting Jupiter. Notice how big some of these splotches actually are. Again, be very thankful that we have a Jupiter to kind of be our cosmic vacuum cleaner and allow us to watch this from afar. All right, one thing that Hubble has really allowed us to do is to watch the entire life cycle of stars. Now we cannot see a star form, live and die in its entire life cycle, life cycle because it takes far too long compared to a human lifetime to see the process from beginning to end with one particular object. However, we can take a look at many, many different objects and piece together the entire life cycle of different kinds of stars. Now, all stars form in big, giant groups. And if there is one picture that you've seen from the Hubble Space Telescope, it's probably this one. Um, this is a picture that was released in 1995. Um, so not too long after I started at the Adler, um, this picture was released. These are called the Pillars of Creation. It is... Um, uh, a portion of a nebula, a large cloud of gas and dust called the Eagle Nebula. It doesn't look like an eagle. So if you're trying to find an eagle in there, don't worry, it doesn't look like an eagle to me either. Um, but these, uh, these clouds are where stars are forming. And uh, so the pillars, just the name just refers to the shape. The creation refers to the formation of stars within the pillars. Well, the problem is, you can't see inside these pillars. These are very dusty, dusty places. And so light that our eyes can see cannot pass through um, these dusty clouds. And so how in the world can we see inside? Well, stay tuned. Um, they came back to this particular object in 2015 and kind of filled out the picture a little bit more. And uh, what's happening here is there, there's a very large star up uh, above the edge of the picture that you can't see in this image. Uh, but the light and heat from this star and, and other stars are just eroding these pillars. Um, and so they are kind of, you can say, boiling away or evaporating away at the top. And you can see everything else uh, behind. Now, again, we can't see inside these pillars. How can we do that? Well, the Hubble Space Telescope can see light that your eyes can see. We call that visible light. It can also see a little bit of infrared. You might know that more as heat. Um, it can see a little bit of ultraviolet and ultraviolet, uh, one form of ultraviolet um, is the light that gives you a sun tan, that's UVA, or a sun burn, that's UVB. And the really, really harmful um, ultraviolet light is called UVC. So ultraviolet is a much more energetic type of light. Well, in order to see inside this dust, um, we need infrared. Um, so these this dust is warm, the stars are warming up the dust, and so that light can actually pass through. So what does this look like in infrared light? Here's the exact same picture, but using the infrared light that Hubble can, the little bit that it can detect. I'm gonna toggle back and forth just to show you, I think, I, again, I think you can see my cursor. Um, take a look at some of these bright stars and just focus on those and note that those are still in the picture. But notice how many more stars are in this picture if you, in essence, remove the dust. If you can see through the dust, the dust is there, the stars are there, the dust is blocking the visible light from the stars, but the infrared light can pass through. So uh, we, we, we basically need to look at the rest of the universe using multifaceted eyes. We, we need to look at different kinds of light to get a much fuller story of what is happening out there. 
because the light that our eyes can see is only one small part of the story. Uh, so Hubble allows us to do this and other telescopes allows us, uh, allow us to do it too. I mentioned that stars form in big groups. Here's a, here's a, a group that's a little farther along. Um, it is what we call a cluster of stars. And you can see them, they're all, they're all kind of clustered together there. And here's another one. So really, really pretty. Now our sun likely formed in a cluster like this. And over time, our sun has gradually moved away from the rest of the stars that it formed with. The same thing will happen to these stars here. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's an ongoing question in astronomy, where are the stars that our sun formed with? Um, and it's a really hard one to answer because it's been 5 billion, billion with a B, years since that happened and they've all kind of moved away from each other. So the question in astronomy is often, uh, where are those stars? How can we identify them? They're out there, um, but how can we identify them? So that's, a, that's an ongoing question. So as the stars form, sometimes solar systems or stellar systems form around those stars. And so a, a well-known star factory is this one. It's called the Orion Nebula. You might have heard of it. It just means the fuzzy thing in the direction of the constellation Orion. And if we look within this dusty gas cloud here, so the gas is mostly hydrogen, the dust is just really, really tiny, tiny, tiny pieces of essentially rock and metal. Um, if we look really closely, we can start to see these little, these little bits. They sort of look like little tadpoles, but they're actually newly forming solar systems. So within these, uh, these shrouds of dust, we have stars. There are a star within each one and dust forming or dust around it. And then what happens is the dust starts to clump together to form larger objects and those larger bits clump together and those form um, early planets and those larger bits clump together and they run together and they form planets as a whole. But in this particular case, um, it's a race against time because these all definitely look like tadpoles. Um, in the case of the Orion Nebula, we've got some really hot bright stars that are off the edges of these pictures that are essentially the light and heat from those stars are eroding the dust. Um, and so it's a race against time. Will the planets form before the, the other stars blow away all the dust? Um, come back in about a million years and we may have the answer to that question. So anyway, uh, it's really interesting to see all these different types of stars forming and different ways they, they all form, but they essentially all form the same basic way uh, in big groups and how they end up depends on how big they are. Now, occasionally we like to get pictures of planets around other stars. Uh, and up until about two months ago when I gave this presentation, um, I would title this next section, taking, taking pictures of other planets. Cause how cool is it that Hubble can take a picture of a planet around another star? But I had to add or not because of what happened with this particular picture. And so this is a, uh, a system called, the star is called Fomalhaut. And it is a star that if you know where to look um, in our, I think it's in the late summer, early fall, you can see this star with your, with your, just your eyes. That's, you don't need a telescope to see it. Um, now with something like the Hubble, um, we need to see the dusty disk that's around this star. What they did was they blocked out the light from the star. They essentially have a way of doing that within the telescope. They blocked the light from the star because it's way too bright. And they wanted to see the dusty stuff around it because they noticed, hey, this, this dusty disk is kind of warped. And maybe, ah, oh, what caused the warp? There could be a planet orbiting this star. Oh, lo and behold, we got a picture of it. How great is that? So they took a picture uh, every few years and they were able to follow this quote unquote planet um, as it orbited Fomalhaut. The problem is that planet does not exist. What they think happened was when they took the picture back in 2004, it was right after um, this it may not have been big enough to be a planet. It might've just been a large chunk, ran into another large chunk. And what they actually got a picture of 
was the expanding cloud of debris from, from this no longer existing large planet chunk. And over time, this thing expanded and dispersed. This planet does not exist anymore. Um, all it is is a chunk of debris or a, or a, a cloud of debris um, uh, that will eventually disperse. So I used to say, look, hey, how cool is it? We got a picture of a planet around another star. No, in this particular case, we don't. <laughs> so um, that's why I love astronomy so much because it changes. Sometimes over a very short period of time, it changes. All right, I mentioned that stars all form the same way. How, how long they live their lives, in essence, depends on how big they are. Big stars live fast, die young. Small stars live a long time. So stars meet their demise in interesting ways, depending on if they are big ones, medium-sized ones, or little ones. So in 1987, there was a, uh, an observer down in the Southern Hemisphere, um, I believe in South America, who walked outside and noticed a, a bright light in the sky that where a bright light hadn't been noticed before. And um, what happened was a star had exploded and we call that a supernova. The, the word nova just means new. And so they needed a name that essentially conveyed, ooh, this new bright thing. Um, and so supernova was, was the name given. And uh, it was well before this particular thing was seen, but hey, the star basically blew itself up. And so every few years, they've been able to go back to the same object and look at it and just look at the picture on the top left and look at the picture on the lower right. You can see they look vastly different. I'm not gonna go into the details of what the difference is. Just note that we can see change over time with the, with the Hubble Space Telescope. Things in astronomy are not static and, and placid and, and unchanging from one century to the next. Uh, we saw these changes just over the course of a small handful of decades. And if you put these images together, the, the many times that they've gone back to look at this object, you definitely can see these changes over time. So um, it's, it's great to have an instrument, the same instrument, going back and looking at the same objects, um, because then you can, you can really get a sense of what's happening there. Now, I mentioned before that um, we can use the Hubble Space Telescope to look at stuff, but sometimes it's even better if you have other telescopes looking at the same object. Now, here is uh, a, the remnants of a star that the explosion, the supernova, was seen on Earth almost a thousand years ago uh, in the year 1054 AD. This is called the Crab Nebula. And if you're trying to find a picture of a crab there, don't worry, it does not look like one. Uh, side note, the name crab in Latin mean it, the word is cancer. And people noted, even before we really knew what cancer was, they noted the shapes of tumors were oftentimes these filamenty sorts of shapes. So the name in this case, the Crab Nebula, it doesn't refer to the fact that this thing really looked like a, or ever did look like a crab. Um, it was referring to the, the kind of a combination of the Latin word and the, the um, uh, what we saw in biology here on Earth. It was kind of mimicking uh, shapes and, and structures that we see uh, out there in the universe. Just a, a coincidence, but it's an interesting thing. But all the colors that you see in this picture, uh, they're not quote unquote real. What they are is different types of light being detected by different observatories. And you can see the different images at the bottom. Each one is from a different telescope. And when you combine them together, you get a much fuller, richer picture of the object that you're looking at. So anyway, um, it's, it's again a, a star that, it, that almost obliterated itself. Um, but we go back and we look at it with different telescopes. And if we then look at another remnant of a, of a star that exploded, uh, this one is um, uh, showing a, a dispersing of a cloud of, of gas from this uh, star that no longer exists um, out through space. Now you may be wondering, all right, 
let me set the watch. When is that going to happen to our sun? When is our sun going to explode? And the answer is never. Um, our sun is not big enough to explode. It will never go supernova like this. Um, what it will do, though, is in about three to five billion with a B years, it will start to expand and slowly puff off its outer layers into space. Um, when that happens, we get this structure uh, similar to something like this. Uh, this is called a, this is one, uh, uh, before I give you the word or the phrase, I need to explain. In astronomy, we often name things and then figure out what they are and then don't go back and change the name, even if the name is confusing and has nothing to do with what we were talking about. In this case, this object is called a planetary nebula because someone saw one of these things in a telescope and said, oh, cool, great, round, like a planet. Has nothing to do with planets. This is, a, this is the remnant of a star that puffed off its outer layers into space. And then the object in the middle is called a white dwarf. Again, uh, naming it first and then figuring out what it is. That's the leftover core, the center of the star, again, that no longer exists. But in about 5 billion years, our sun might look something like this or like this. Here's another example. Or this one. This one is called the Cat's Eye Nebula. It's one of the few that look like what it's actually named for. Um, this one is uh, sometimes called the Bug Nebula. Some people have called it the Butterfly Nebula, although if I'm not mistaken, there's another one with the name Butterfly, so that gets a little confusing sometimes. Anyway, um, so this is just another example, and here's another one. So you, it's the same process, different stars, but they end up in slightly different configurations and makes for some, some really interesting um, end results. But again, this is more like what our sun will end up as, again, in about 5 billion years. Everyone always wants to know about black holes. Everybody loves the name. Nobody knows what, nobody tends to know what they are, <laughs> but we all love the name. We want to know, what are those black holes? Well, they're kind of neither black nor a hole. Um, in this particular case, there are giant giant, giant black holes, which are uh, concentrations of, of mass and, and gravity, uh, lots and lots of mass in a small space. But some of these are really big, meaning huge concentrations of, of mass in a space that's less than the diameter of our solar system. So that's a lot. So that's, that's, a, that's a small space and a lot of stuff to cram into that small space. And so what the Hubble Space Telescope found was these giant, we call them supermassive black holes, are in the centers of most of the galaxies out there, including our own Milky Way. Um, so here's an example. Um, this, uh, the picture on the left is showing uh, that kind of speckled pattern. That's essentially a picture taken using light that your eyes can see. The, the jets coming out the top and the bottom, that is looking uh, using a, a type of light, I think radio light, that your eyes can't see. Um, but if you center in on the center of this galaxy, which is what Hubble did, um, then you've got the picture on the right. And the very dot in the middle shows the area right around that black hole. Um, not terribly close to it, but close enough. In this, pic in this particular picture, closer than, than anything we had seen at the time. Um, so the, the question in astronomy is, how do galaxies form? Do they form with these super massive black holes? Um, do they start small and just sort of eat each other up and they get bigger and bigger? Um, how, how exactly does all that happen? And how early on in the universe did this happen? Uh, these are all open questions. And so I uh, can't really give you any definitive answers, but it's still cool to think about and makes you wonder um, what's going on in the centers of these galaxies. By the way, don't worry. Just like you don't have to worry about our sun exploding anytime soon, well, ever. Uh, we don't have to worry about these black holes. We're nowhere near uh, the center of the galaxy. So um, don't have to worry about this one. Just It's a cool thing, at, and we're nowhere near this black hole either. Um, it's a cool thing to contemplate. You're not going to fall into one, so don't worry. One thing that Hubble has showed us is galaxies evolve. They run into each other 
a lot. Um, so the picture on the left is was taken by a telescope on the ground. The green outlined box is the picture on the right, and that is the one taken by Hubble. And so this shows two galaxies. There's, these are called the antennae galaxies or the antenna galaxies. These, uh, there's kind of a, what the heck is this when you're looking at the picture on the left? In the picture on the right, you have two galaxies in the process of colliding. So in the middle of smushing together. Um, here's another set. So what's interesting about this one is even these two bulges, the, the middles of these galaxies are about the same size. And so this is a merger of two galaxies that are each about the same size. Usually one ends up being bigger than the other. Um, this is a little more rare to have two of them about the same size. Um, and so we get these snapshots of, of these galaxy mergers. Um, by the way, this particular picture was taken uh, because there are occasional gaps in the telescope's observing schedule that allows uh, a few additional pictures to be to be squeezed in. So they're not taking data on a particular experiment or anything like that. Um, they just go, man, I just want a picture of this thing over here. I want a picture of that thing over there. So they'll squeeze in a few pictures uh, from time to time. But when we look around the universe, we see these uh, galaxy collisions all over the place. Now these are static images. Again, this happens over the course of such a long period of time that the human lifetime just can't see this happen from beginning to end. So what do you do? What you do is you take a bunch of these pictures, you run a com you come up with a computer model and you try to, to run the model forward in your computer and you find examples of, of certain stopping points in the model and see, can you find something out there in the real universe that matches the model? In this case, we can. So let me show you my very favorite uh, simulation. So we've got two computer model galaxies, about the same size. Um, and you run the clock forward and look, there we've got two galaxies that are about to run into each other. Then you run the model, the same model forward. You change your perspective a little bit. So you haven't changed the model. You've just changed the direction you're looking. And lo and behold, we find another one. And then you run the model forward some more. And look how twisted and warped and weird this all looks. There's another example, a different example. You run the model forward some more. And you change the view just a little bit. Again, change the perspective that you're viewing at the angle. There's another example. And you keep doing that. And what you've got is a really robust computer model because you can find real things. They didn't create the model to match the stuff they've seen. You create the model and then go find stuff in the universe that, that matches what you see. Um, so you're not out there looking for stuff that you already know to be the case. You're, you're looking for, for what actually matches your model. And this, and this actually does. So one thing that Hubble has been really good at is figuring out what's in our universe, looking in the distant, uh, looking out into the distance. And this is called the Hubble deep field. And it came about because uh, there were scientists wondering, so have we seen everything out there? Uh, wh what's out there in the dark patches that we, that we haven't been able to really study? So they basically took a bunch of time available on the Hubble. Uh, this was in the 90s. And they said, okay, we're going to stare at a spot in the sky for a few days worth of time. We're going to add all that stuff up together and we're going to get an image. There were some people saying, you're not going to... You don't see anything in that dirt. We're not going to get a picture of something. You're going to waste all that time. And they're going to be, basically they said, well, no matter what we get an image of, it'll be an interesting result, right? So what they got was this image. And almost everything that you see in this picture is a galaxy. Um, again, I think you can see my cursor. So this object right here, that is a star within our own Milky Way. 
and um, essentially think of it like the spots on the window. You're looking, uh, you're standing at the kitchen window, looking uh, at the window itself, looking out toward the backyard, and you have to look past some spots on the glass. Um, so these stars are within our own Milky Way galaxy. They're like the spots on the window. And there are maybe six uh, stars within our Milky Way in this picture. Everything else, every other dot, fuzz, whatever that's in this picture is a completely separate galaxy composed of millions, billions, or even maybe a trillion or more stars. Um, how amazing is that to think about? So there are a few thousand in this picture. Uh, they went back and uh, did it again. This is called the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. And they use the full capabilities of the telescope looking in with the visible light that your eyes can see. A little bit of ultraviolet, a little bit of infrared, and they got this picture. So again, here's a spot on the window. This star, this, it looks like a starburst on the lower right. There's one here. There's a, there's a handful of others, but I, I think I can basically count on maybe one hand, maybe two. The spots on the window that we're looking past, every other thing, fuzz thing, in this picture is another galaxy. Now they're all at different distances. Um, this It's something that's very hard to tell from this picture is are you looking at stuff that's big and far or, or small and close? Um, it's hard to tell without other information added in, but how cool is that to, to see all that stuff in that picture? And I just want to show you some pretty pictures because Hubble has taken some astonishingly gorgeous pictures. Um, how about the planet Jupiter? How amazing is this? This is a fairly true color picture. Um, I get asked a lot if these pictures are true color. And in, in reality, Hubble takes pictures in black and white, uh, but they use different filters. They, 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 they uh, gather up different wavelengths of light and then they can assign colors to those and essentially you can get a true color picture or at least a picture in color, may not be true color. Here's this one. This is a, um, a nebula, a place where stars are forming um, called the Carina Nebula. It's, it's visible in the Southern Hemisphere. This is another cluster of stars that, that uh, formed in a big giant group. Here's another star cluster. And probably one of my favorite Hubble pictures is this one. Um, this is a V838 Monoceratus and um, it essentially is a star that brightened uh, over a short period of time and the, 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 the light is, is going outward in a shell and lighting up dust and stuff that's around this particular star. Um, and over time, they've gone back to this object to take pictures and you can actually see, you can track the progression of the light as it's passing the dust uh, and lighting up different parts of the cloud that's around that particular star. And just a cool looking galaxy, right? This is, this is another spiral, just pretty, pretty stuff. But also, take a look, there is a distant galaxy, probably far beyond this one. There's another one over here on the, on the right. There's another one. All the stuff, almost everything that you see is either this galaxy or galaxies beyond it. That's a star within our own Milky Way. And if you're wondering how I know that, do you see that crisscross pattern? That's caused by a pinpoint thing, a star. Um, to the telescope, it looks like a pinpoint. Um, and the light comes into the telescope and has to pass essentially some of the workings, the inner workings of the telescope. And that crisscross shape gets imprinted on the, on the light from that star, that pinpoint. It's, it's the physics of the, of the light passing through the telescope that, that creates that crisscross pattern. But you only see that with essentially pinpoints, stars. They are big, but they're far. So to the telescope, they look like pinpoints. Um, so that's how I know that that's a star within our own Milky Way. And now you can pick it out too. All right, just a handful more slides and then we'll take some questions. Um, there is a successor to the Hubble. Uh, it's called the James Webb Space Telescope. Its launch has been delayed a number of years because lo and behold, uh, launching a really big telescope is hard and building a really big telescope is hard and testing a really big telescope is hard. And how big are we talking? We're talking this big. This is 
a full-scale model of the James Webb Space Telescope and you can see all the people that are there um, standing around it. That is just a fraction of the team that has worked on this telescope over the years. Um, and so this telescope, if you take a look at Hubble's mirror compared to a person, and then the James Webb Space Telescope mirror. You can see the difference in size. And um, this telescope will see completely and only in the infrared part of the, um, of the, of the light that, uh, that, that's out there. So we're gonna see, we're gonna add on even more information um, to the stuff that Hubble has studied. In order to get this thing in space, you literally have to fold it. So this telescope, is folded prior to going up into space and it has to unfold itself sans people <laughs> once it gets up into space which is if you want to look into the engineering involved in that definitely check it out it is fascinating um, but here is the telescope fully put together except for that heat shield part at the bottom that uh, uh, that was in that model so um, again you can see the size of the telescope uh, compared to the size of the person or the people in the lower right. And they've been building it. This is the structure on the back of the telescope. Um, so it is going to be a humongous telescope. And this is the heat shield. It needs to point away from the sun. And so the sun shield keeps any, any light from the sun from falling on the telescope, which would essentially ruin it if that happened. Um, you need to keep this telescope very, very cold so it points permanently away from the sun so it is going to launch we hope fingers crossed october 21st of the year 2021 so i just wanted to show you that i did not call it uh, i called it the successor to hubble but in reality we hope it will be flying at the same time that hubble will be flying we hope that Hubble will still be working in uh, late 2021 and then early 2022. Um, so if that's the case, then Hubble and the James Webb will look at the same stuff and different stuff um, to get an even more full picture of stuff that's out there in the universe. So we are spot on on time. So um, Wendy, do you want to feed questions to me or do you want me to go through the through the Q&A myself? How would you like I me to do that? I would like to do that if you, you don't got it. mind. Sure. Uh, let me just well, I get grab back my on camera. Okay, speaker view. Um, uh, and you were on camera uh, and we lost you. <laughs> You're still there, but. Right. Okay, we so we have a lot of questions. All right, uh, bring it on. All right, uh, Chris would like to know, is anyone else having problems? Uh, no, that's not for you. All right, <clears throat> Richard says, the clarity of far distant objects is wonderful, but aren't there things between us and it that ought to be getting in the way of the photos? How are those avoided? Uh, they're not, uh, simply put. So sometimes stuff is in front of other stuff. Um, and uh, I'll give you a perfect example, our own Milky Way. Um, there's a lot of dust in the Milky Way and it obscures the view of even just the center of our Milky Way. Um, if you could, if we didn't have all that dust, the center of our Milky Way would be blazingly bright in our evening sky in the summer. Um, and so that because we're facing uh, the direction of the center of our galaxy, um, but in that time period, and so we can't actually see it because of the dust, we can't see it very well because of the dust. Add in what's on the other side of our galaxy, our own Milky Way, we don't have a total 100% complete picture of even what's on the other side of the Milky Way, because there's a lot of dust and stuff in between here and the other side. So, stuff gets in the way of other stuff it just happens and sometimes that helps your observation and sometimes it hinders um luckily the universe is a pretty big place and so it's it's it happens but it's not everything gets in the way of everything so it can be a problem but that's another problem to to have to consider um when when they're taking their observations so good question okay 
Um, Karen would like to know, what's the difference between a black hole and a nebula? Ah, okay. So a neb, um, a black hole, black holes, just your regular garden variety black holes come from the explosion, the supernova of a really, really big star. The stuff that's left over collapses down. And if it collapses down far enough, you get a black hole. Then sometimes black holes merge together and you get a bigger black hole. And sometimes those merge together and you get an even bigger black hole. And we think maybe that may be where those big humongous ones come from. Um, and so, uh, but that the whole process of how you make the big giant ones is not totally understood. So I'm glossing over the details on purpose and waving my hands because I don't have the answer, um, but nobody does. And so um, a nebula can result from one of those supernova explosions. The star explodes and gas and stuff spews out and you can get a nebula from that. Um, you can um, get a nebula where stars are forming. You can have a nebula from uh, the, the stuff that puffs off the outer layers of a star like our sun. So in astronomy, we love confusing you. So we have the same word to describe many different things. But black hole specifically refers to lots and lots of mass in a small space. But the word nebula can be attached to lots of different things. We just never went back and changed the name. So, um, Sid Sidoni would like to know how do they keep the mirror clean? Uh huh. How Great long question. will yeah. the Hubble last in space? Yeah. Um, it has already lasted longer than we thought it would. Um, 30 years is well beyond the, the lifetime, uh, but the engineers built that thing to last. And the servicing missions, there were uh, five of them in all. And so that has extended the life of the telescope as well. Um, and how do they keep the mirror clean? You don't. Um, occasionally, you're going to get something hitting the mirror. Uh, thankfully, uh, there's not a lot of dust in space. So um, space is not, em it's not totally empty, but it's mostly empty. Um, but for the most part, whatever happens to settle on the mirror and stay there will, will just stick. So, okay. yeah. Um, Lenore, oh, uh, the question about how long it will last. Mm -hmm. No idea. <laughs> it could stop working today. Um, uh, a stray meteor could run into something important and we no longer have a functioning telescope. So they're just going to keep running that thing till it, till the wheels fall off. Okay. Um, Chris would like to know, are the pictures color enhanced? In some cases, yes. Um, in some cases, they are true color as in uh, they are manipulated so that they look like what your eyes would see. A lot of times they'll do that with the solar system ones. Um, but our eyes are actually not great for seeing color. You need a lot of light to see color. So out in space, stuff is not going to look very colorful because it's dark and your eyes are just not that good <laughs> at seeing color. Um, and so uh, in some cases they are enhanced or um, they just assign certain colors to certain wavelengths and they'll bring out certain features that they might want to point out, but they may not be true color. So, um, so no, not all the pictures are true color and some are enhanced or um, manipulated in some way to bring out a feature that an, maybe a scientist wants to, wants to take a look at. Okay. Lenore asks, anything you can tell us about W first? Hmm. I am not familiar enough with W first. I thought. Can you tell us what it is? Uh, um, w first, Wide Field Infrared Survey Telescope. I believe that's the one that just got renamed the Nancy Roman Space Telescope. I think. And forgive me if I may be conflating two different telescopes. I think that's the one. Um, if that's true, then that telescope will launch in like the mid 2020s. 
Um, so it's being designed and uh, being designed right now. I don't think they've gotten to construction yet. Um, I think that's the right one. So yeah, it's still still literally kind of on the drawing board for that one. But uh, construction, if I've got the right one in my head, then that one will happen uh, a little bit later. Okay. Ken asks, why do some of these pictures have top pointing, right pointing, left pointing, bottom pointing highlights coming from the stars? Uh, it depends, just depends on the orientation of the telescope. So the, the, um, the, the crisscross pattern, the, 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 the guts, the inner workings of the telescope. So the light comes in through the tube, bounces off that main mirror, comes back up, and there's a secondary mirror held by a structure. And it's that the, the part of that structure holding that mirror, that's the part that, that gets um, imp imprinted on, the, on those star images. And depending on where the telescope is pointed circularly, um, that's why you'll see some of them like this or that or whatever. So yeah, simply the direction the telescope was pointed. That's all. Okay. Susie asks, is it too late to see the neo Wise comet? And uh, if not best tips to see it from the suburbs, times, directions, et cetera? At this point, you really got to know where it is. Um, it's not too late if you have a really decent pair of binoculars um, or a good telescope. So with your eye, done. It's, it's, not, it's not visible. Um, if you know where to point your binoculars and or telescope, um, then yes, you can. The best tip at this point that I can give you is get one of those good sky apps for your smartphone. And several of them have incorporated um, the, the Neowise Comet um, uh, into, the, into, the, into the app. So you can tell it, look for the comet, and you need the actual name of the comet, which is uh, C slash 2020, as in the year, F, as in Frank, the number three. C2020 F3, because there are 14 other comets that also contain the word Neowise. Um, so C2020 F3 is the name of the comet. And so if you get one of those phone apps, um, like Sky Safari or Stellarium or, or something like that, you can dial it up, it'll tell you where it is, and then you can point a pair of binoculars or a telescope at it. Um, so it's not easy to do right now, you can still do it. Okay, Mimi asks, is any astronomer at the Adler still studying the, I, I'm not sure how to pronounce this, N-A-Z-C-A lines? Oh, the Nazca, the Nazca lines. Um, no, uh, the astronomer who studied those, uh, her name is Phyllis Pitluga. She retired in 2002. So um, she retired uh, almost, um, almost 20 years ago. So now she is, she is retired. She is living in Mexico um, and she's doing well. Last time I talked to her, which was uh, last year, and I get an email from her occasionally, but no, we don't have anybody uh, at the Adler who studies the Nazca lines anymore. Okay. Um, Gary asks, um, could you tell us something about the super telescope in Chile? There's um, several. And how it um, compares. Yes, yeah, yeah. So, yep, there are several telescopes um, that have been built in Chile and are being built in Chile. Uh, there's one that is being built. Um, um, oh, shoot, I'm blanking. Um, uh, it is. Oh, my goodness. I am thoroughly blanking. Well, the what this telescope will do is it's not a huge telescope, but it's going to, it has a wide field of view, much wider than something like Hubble, which looks at a really small piece of sky. This one will look at a wider piece of sky. And so it's going to um, essentially scan the entire sky above the telescope every three days. And it's going to look for um, changes over time every, every three days. There's that one. There's a, there's the, uh, there's a giant telescope that's, that's being built. I, don't know where that one is in construction right now. Things have been thrown thoroughly out of whack with the with the pandemic. So I have no idea where that one is right now. Um, the giant Magellan telescope. I think that's the one. Um, and there are a few others that have already been built, but they might have more being added on. So anyway, uh, take your pick <laughs> with with uh, those telescopes in Chile. But a lot of times for now, the, the some of the operations have been suspended due to the pandemic. So. Faye asks, how big are the three pillars? Oh, gosh. 
Um, those three pillars are, I want to say, uh, if the pillars of creation, so think of the picture in your, in your mind, if you put the sun at the top of one of the pillars, the closest star to us, uh, um, uh, Alpha Centauri, well, it's not quite Alpha Centauri, but Alpha Centauri is the one you've probably heard of. It would be at the bottom of the pillar. So it's a, they're about four or five light years in length, meaning a beam of light would take about four or five years to get from one end to the next, to the bottom. So that, that gives you a sense of, of how big you can fit those pillars in between us and our closest neighbor star. Okay, great. Um, uh, let's, uh, Jean would like to know, how is the Chandra telescope different from the Hubble? Oh, Chandra is an X-ray telescope. So it looks at X-rays. So Hubble looks at light that your eyes can see, a little bit of infrared, a little bit of ultraviolet. Chandra is X-rays, so exclusively X-rays. So it's looking at the really energetic stuff out in space. And uh, is named for Chandrasekhar, who is a, uh, a very famous, very amazing um, uh, Indian scientist, uh, especially uh, did a lot of his most amazing work in like the 1930s and 40s. Uh, but he was at the University of Chicago. So he's, he's, he's a, local, a local hero to a whole bunch of astronomers. Uh, Davida asks, um, after say approximately 2023, will Hubble be retired and retrieved? Retrieved, no. Um, don't quite know what is going to happen. Now, they're not going to, uh, they won't necessarily retire Hubble. I can't see that. I don't see that happening. It could, they may decide, okay, we're done spending money on operating this thing. But the major cost is in the design, the build, the launch. Uh, less and less is the operation. Once you've got it up in space, it's, it doesn't cost that much to operate it in the grand scheme of things. Um, so they're going to operate it pretty much for as long as they can. Um, so, but chances are it won't be retrieved because we don't have a way to bring it back. Um, the only way to do that was the space shuttle. And so we have no more space shuttles. So we have no more way of actually bringing that back. Okay. Gloria asks, um, please tell us more about Hubble himself or herself. Edwin, yeah, Edwin Hubble was originally from Wheaton, Illinois. Um, local guy, uh, went to the University of Chicago. And he essentially, I'll, I'll put his most famous discovery in, in as much of a nutshell as I can. Um, there were stars that were noticed to change in brightness. We call them variable stars. Their, their light output varies. And there was a, a female astronomer um, who figured out that uh, you can use the, the, the time period for those stars to change in brightness to figure out how bright they're supposed to be. If you can figure out how bright they're supposed to be, you can figure out how far away they are. So he was looking for those variable stars to try to figure out, because one of the things that they didn't know at the time truly was all the nebulae, some of them were spiral shaped and some of them are round and are they all within our own Milky Way? Are some of them outside of our Milky Way? And he found one of these variable stars in the what was known at the time as the Andromeda Nebula. Again, it was a fuzzy thing, just named them all Nebula. And he figured out, oh wow, based on how bright this thing should be, based on how, how often it brightens and dims, it is really far away. This thing is outside of our own Milky Way. And so therefore the name was changed to from Andromeda Nebula to Andromeda Galaxy. And so it, that was his most famous uh, discovery, was these, these island galaxies are actually not all within our own Milky Way. They're not small and, and, and close. They are big and far. And um, so that was, that was what he's most known for. OK. So the, the Hubble is staying in space permanently. Well, if they don't. Uh, essentially boost it because it has no rockets attached. So 
over time, its orbit will slowly erode um, and degrade, so it'll get lower and lower. Eventually, it would fall into Earth's atmosphere, and not all of it would burn up, and there are pieces and parts of it that would definitely survive down to the ground. Um, so right now, they don't have a controlled way of re-entering it into Earth's atmosphere. It would just sort of happen, and so we want to avoid that. Um, so they're coming up with ways to, to um, address this, to either boost it to a higher orbit or attach a rocket system potentially to control it into, into Earth's atmosphere so that it lands in the middle of the ocean and not in the middle of your backyard. So, um, but yet to be determined, it's just as easy to boost something to a higher orbit as it is to control it to a lower orbit. So, don't know, don't know what, what will happen to it. So, okay, we'll see. Um, there have been several questions asking about the telescope that we see behind you in your own home. Oh, <laughs> that one. Um, well, actually, there's two. Uh, there's that one, <laughs> which is um, one of the Adler's small telescopes. This one only looks at the sun. So this, the brand is called Coronado. It's currently owned by uh, a telescope company called Mead, M-E-A-D-E. -E. Um, but this one looks at a particular wavelength of light from the sun and um, it allows us to see features and, and other things. So occasionally I pull this one out and take pictures and, and show views from it. Now that one, so you can move out of the way. So that one right there, um, that is also one of our small telescopes. And that one um, I can attach some cameras and things to. So if, if there's something interesting to see, I'll take some pictures, I'll share them online, we'll, we'll do a program around them. So, uh, when the right before the Adler closed, um, again it was March 14th. I went around the building and went, "What should I bring home to uh, to get some practice using?" Because we thought, "Oh, well, maybe we'll be closed for two weeks and and or maybe a month." Hey, I'll use this time to get to know this equipment a little better. Well. It's August 4th <laughs> and we're still closed. So we are concentrating on digital programs. And so I brought home the cameras and the telescopes and whatever that allows me to do um, those. That one is um, from a telescope company called Celestron and it's the Celestron 6SE. So it's a tracking telescope. Um, and then there's a, there's another one that you can't really see quite as well. I'm gonna see if I can, I have a bunch of wires attached. Um, you can't really see it. It's behind the Coronado. Yeah, it's a little bit dark. You can sort of see the base of it there. Um, and it's, um, well, actually, no, can't really see it. But it, that one doesn't track. It's a really portable telescope. And so um, that one we take out for our Scopes in the City uh, telescope outreach programs in non-pandemic times. So. On my dining room table over here is all sorts of little bits of telescopes and cameras and, and all sorts of things. So, um, so yeah, it, it's going to be my workspace for quite a while. <laughs> um, several people have asked, how have you got, how, how did you get interested in astronomy? Yeah, so um, first thing, my mom is, was, is interested in um, the original Star Trek uh, TV series, the originals. So she got me hooked on those. Um, I saw Star Wars, the original, in the theater, 77, when I was four. And <laughs> when the Death Star, I know, sorry. <laughs> when the Death Star, well, I say that, and I work with, <laughs> I work with a bunch of people who hardly even saw it in the theater when they released it like five times later. So anyway. Um, uh, that's pretty Star. progressive, though, to go to be taken to that movie if we're right. When yeah. the Death Star, when the Death Star exploded, everybody cheered. Um, I still remember that vividly too. And um, uh, Star Trek the movie and Close Encounters of the Third Kind, and so a lot of my really initial interest be was because of movies and TV. Then um, I saw Carl Sagan's Cosmos TV series and I got really hooked. I didn't know everything that he was talking about because I was eight. And so my parents noticed that I was interested in all this stuff. And so we became members of the Adler Planetarium uh, in the early 80s and visited many, many, many times. And uh, fast forward to 1995, I work at the place where I used to visit. 
So I consider myself really lucky. Um, I went to space camp. I worked at space camp. Um, I worked at a planetarium in Champaign, went to the University of Illinois. Um, my bachelor's degree is in physics and astronomy. And um, there's a planetarium at the local community college there. And so I, I worked there for, for a couple of years. And the Adler was the only place that I applied to out of college. And I got lucky because <laughs> I don't know. People ask, what would you be doing if you weren't doing this? I go, I have no idea. <laughs> So what I tell uh, teenagers, especially, uh, or early uh, college uh, entrants is, is try to find that thing you really like to do and then find someone who'll pay you to do it. Because that's what good, I did. Good advice. <laughs> um, here's a comment from someone. Presumably all the photos you showed are of events that took place a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. okay. Yep. Yeah. And um, the farther away that you're looking, the farther away the object, the longer it took the light to get to get here. So the farther back in time you're looking. And so that's why we use we use light as a as a signpost as a distance marker in space because um, it travels so fast, but distances are so vast. And so we use the term light year to describe the distance that a beam of light will travel in one year, which is about six trillion miles. Um, but the closest star to us outside our own solar system is four light years away. So about 25 trillion miles. And it took the light from that star four years to get here. And everything else is even farther away than that. And so um, it's, it's, it's where things start getting very mind melty and, and brain cells start exploding when you start thinking about stuff like that. Yes, I would agree. <laughs> um, uh, Tina asks, the center of what would be left of our sun after the outer layers are sloughed off, yep. what would that be? White dwarf. It'd be the core of our of our sun. It, it, and another name for that is a white dwarf because basically they named it. They said, oh, it's white and it's small. We will call it a white dwarf. What is it? Oh, later we figured out it's the center of a, a star that sloughed off its, its outer layers into space. So there you go. That's actually something that kind of looks like what it's supposed to be. So the name is actually pretty good. Got it. Um... Stephanie asks, how does this tell us to understand the origin of our universe and all matter? Yeah, and, and actually one thing that they've been able to do with the telescope is you can take data on um, how far away things are and, and there's different, without getting into all the, the really brain sizzling details, um, you can take data to, to figure out essentially how fast the universe is expanding. And from that, you can wind the clock back and figure out how old the universe is. And so um, the only problem is Hubble can only see back so far. Um, and that's where we need telescopes like the James Webb to be able to look back even farther. Um, the problem arises because we've gotten two different numbers for the age of the universe. They're not that different, but they are different slightly. Um, and so there's a big controversy in astronomy right now as to why we're getting two different numbers from the same, uh, from, from different ways of looking at different bits of, of information. Nobody's wrong. It's not that, oh, one of them is right and the other, well, actually, we don't know that. It, it's, it's difficult to do, but Hubble can help us with, with the data for that, but only to a point where we need these other telescopes to help us look back even farther um, and look back in time. Um, Hubble has the, the record right now for the farthest distant galaxy. Um, I didn't show a picture of it, but um, it just looks like a little red splotch. And it that picture corresponds to an object where the light left it about 400 million years after the formation of the universe. And so the, the James Webb will actually be able to see light that's even older than that. Wow. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Again, more brain cells melting and exploding right now. So it does it to me too. <laughs> that's comforting. Is our galaxy likely to collide with another sometime? Mm -hmm. 
Yep, we are on a collision course right now with the Andromeda galaxy. Um, it'll probably be more of a glancing blow. We thought up until relatively recently that it was going to be pretty much a direct collision, but it's not. Um, it'll be more like a glancing blow, but don't worry. Um, we're talking about 4 billion years in the future that this process of colliding will start. And it will take probably another 3 billion years after that for the, for the end result. Um, but well, the amazing thing about these galaxy collisions is stars don't run into each other. Space is so empty, they just slide right past each other. Uh, at most, with one of these galaxy collisions, maybe you'll get a couple of stars running into each other. These are out of literally hundreds of billions of stars. Um, you might get a couple, a handful that might run into each other, but that's it. So, uh, so yeah, short answer is yes, Andromeda in about four to seven ish billion years. But don't worry, what, what actually collides is uh, those big gas clouds because they're much bigger than the stars. And so when these gas clouds smoosh together, that's when you get new stars forming. And that's why those ones that are colliding look so bright is they've got, uh, they've got stars that have formed because of the collision happening. Okay, Dolores asks, how long have we benefited or how have we benefited, excuse me, how have we benefited from the Hubble besides accumulating more knowledge? Yeah, so I'll give you a very, very concrete example. Um, before they sent up the instrumentation to fix the flaws in the mirror, uh, what the scientists had to do was use some computer manipulation. They knew what the flaw was, they knew what the shape of it was. So when you get the imagery back, you can adjust it for that flaw and essentially take all that light that wasn't in the main part of your image and squish it all with a computer, uh, squish it all to do that. It's um, uh, basically doing image manipulation, not in a negative way, but it's to be able to, to account for that flaw. They then took this image manipulation and morphed it into essentially imaging um, uh, breast cancer tumors. And so, again, they did not build the Hubble to get this, this uh, ability to work with images to image breast cancer tumors. Somebody went, you know, this technique could be useful over here. And so these are called spin-off technologies, and they happen all the time in astronomy. We can never anticipate all the spin-offs that will happen because of space exploration or 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 astronomy or any science there's always a spin-off that is useful someplace else that nobody even thought about um, when they first came up with that idea but that's a very concrete example of um, of digital image processing to help locate breast cancer tumors because of the flaw in the Hubble's mirror and the digital image processing that they had to do to get the images looking the way that they should um, before they sent up the, the, the fixes. Okay. Um, let me just add here, a lot of um, feedback in Q&A. I left off uh, by mistake and um, an option for um, everything was fine or no complaints in question five. I'm trying to fix that now, but um, I just want to make you aware. I hear of that and I'm sorry. Uh, okay, let's see. Uh, Murray asks, why should we be interested in the existence of a black hole? The short answer is you don't have to. <laughs> That's sort of my it's it, honestly it's getting a much fuller picture of the universe as a whole as, as a as a complete set um why should we be interested in any of it it's the universe we live in and so knowing what's around the neighborhood and knowing what's off in the distance and um how things can affect us in the future or not um and um Basically, you could ask that question of just about any other science as well. You pick a thing and you go, do I really need to know about why a certain flower is a certain color? I, I'm making that up. I'm not disparaging flowers and, and all that. It's, it's, it's getting a much better sense of 
where our universe came from. Um, why is it here? Or how is it here? Sorry, not why. That's a, that's that's the realm of religion. Why is religion? How is science? Um, and 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 getting that much richer sense. And so that's a kind of the short answer to that. Um, but the the neat thing about astronomy and basically any other science is um, not all astronomers are interested in black holes either. Um, they're, they specialize quite a bit, just like medical doctors do. And so there's a bunch of astronomers who would go, I don't care one bit about black holes. <laughs> I care about life on Mars or something like that. So, um, so yeah, you could answer that in a few different ways. <laughs> okay. Um, let's see. In the picture of the launch of the Hubble, there was a large patch that looks like a reflection of the sky. What was it? Let me go back and check. I don't remember. So hang on. I'm, I'm going back in my presentation. I'm going to go take a quick look. Um, there was, oh, um, if they're talking about in the foreground, um, here, let me show the, share the, the, the slide real quick. If you're talking about in the foreground, as in this part right down here, the, the water, um, the uh, uh, Kennedy Space Center and Cape Canaveral and all that is on a, a large nature reserve, essentially. Um, it, it's land that's designated for, for nature, which is kind of ironic, actually. And uh, so there are some not huge bodies of water. Um, on the property, but they're relatively nearby. Um, also, the, the, the water, the ponds that are right next to the launch pads also serve as um, uh, coolant for launches. So they would spray down the, the launch pad right before launch, so right before they, they ignite the, um, uh, the rocket engines, basically so you don't melt the launch pad and also to control vibration um, of the of whatever is launching. So essentially so that the vibration of of the engines igniting doesn't go down into the launch pad and reflect back up um, to and then shake the space shuttle apart. It's for heat suppression and sound suppression, vibration suppression. So um, the, so that pool of water is from the nature reserve, but also it served as the water for the coolant towers um, that would then cool off and, and suppress the vibrations on the launch pad. Okay. Um, and also, if you're standing on the launch pad, the Atlantic Ocean is like right there too. That wasn't the Atlantic, but, um, but that's nearby as well. Okay. Barry asks, um, a picture of the galaxy takes a while of exposure to develop. Mm -hmm. Um, several minutes. If so, why is the image still so sharp? Um, basically, so what they do is they essentially stare at the um, the uh, the object that they want to look at, and sometimes you can get an image in a few seconds or minutes, depending on if it's a bright thing, or a few hours if it's a if it's a dim thing, and so. Why is it so sharp? What's all, what's amazing is a lot of times those are individual images that are stitched together to make one big one. It shows you the quality of the pointing mechanism of that telescope that is so exquisitely pointed that you can't see any drift in any of the of the images. They may also have, if there is any drift that shows up, they're able to, to fix some of those image processing issues. But, um, but it just shows you the quality of the equipment that you're working with, um, that, uh, that you just, you get a, an amazingly sharp image. It's just that good of a telescope. It really is. Okay, someone asks, can you recommend an Adler approved video on Hubble? Um, I missed one word that you said. Did you say Adler approved? Is that, is that what you said? Yes. Um, I wouldn't necessarily say approved, but um, I can recommend the Hubble Space Telescope website, 
which why don't I um, let's see uh, I can't really put it in a chat. I'll just, I'll speak it. So it's Hubble site, H-U-B-B-L-E-S-I-T-E dot org. Uh, hang on, let me check. Let me make sure it's dot org and not dot edu. Hang on, let me check. H-U-B-B, yeah, dot org. So H-U-B-B-L-E-S-I-T-E dot org. And that is the Hubble Space Telescope website. And they have umpteen just hundreds of news releases and images and each of the news releases has images sometimes with videos embedded and um, there are videos that are on the site separately to explain different stuff you can get lost in that site for days and so whenever anybody asks about a, a place to go to go to that hubble site site.org. Um, more than likely, there is a Hubble channel on YouTube. Just make sure it's actually Hubble. <laughs> um, it could be NASA, uh, NASA's channel. Um, I haven't explored if there's a, a Space Telescope Science Institute channel on YouTube. It's probably best to go to the Hubble website and then get to wherever channels they've got from there. That way you're getting to the right one and not somebody's copycat or they've taken some of Hubble's information and skewed it or something like that. So go to the Hubble website and get to the channels from there. I would, I would say that would probably be the best thing to do. Okay, great. Um, one more additional comment um, for people who are stuck on question five of the survey and want to advance, please check audio quality and I will assume that that means no complaints. I apologize. Uh, okay. Barry was, uh, would like to know, was Hubble used to view the recent or past solar eclipses? No, um, not at all. Hubble, there are only three things that Hubble doesn't look at. It does not look at um, the sun at all. It would absolutely fry the telescope if they did that. Um, uh, it doesn't look at the sun. It does not look at the planet Mercury because it's too close to the sun usually. And it doesn't look at Venus Kind of for the same reason it it did once, I believe, um, back in the 90s, but they're like, eh, why bother? And so um, they just stay away from those three objects because the sun is way, 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 way too bright. Um, you have to you have to stop down the brightness to look at the sun and there's no way to do that. So Hubble was made to look at dim stuff, not bright stuff. Okay, Michelle, how are you um, for time? Because we have some more questions. Okay, great. Good. Um, there is a very bright star or planet that appears around 4 a.m. in the northeast sky. Yep. Please let me know what it is. Venus. <laughs> it is Venus. Cool. Yep. <laughs> very cool. Um, the Hubble looks back in time. Yes. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Um, are they remodeling Yerkes? Uh, they're gonna have to. Um, the University of Chicago officially transferred ownership to the Yerkes Future Foundation and they are searching for an executive director right now. And then they're going to be engaging in fundraising and one of the major things that they're gonna have to fundraise for is taking care of that building um, because it is 125-ish years old and in major need of upgrading and repair, and it is not handicapped accessible in any way, shape, or form. Um, so if they're not undertaking any, uh, any work on it right now, they're gonna have to. Um, so they, if they raise some money, they may open possibly with some programs before they've done some, some work on the building, but no matter what, they're gonna have to do work on that building. Um, even the terracotta on the outside of the building, they're going to have to work on that. That's literally going to run into the millions just to just to shore up um, badly needed repairs and, and updates and upgrades to that building. Okay. Pat asks, which came first, the Big Bang or the inflationary epoch? Uh, Big Bang came first. Um, so Big Bang is the leading theory. Now, one thing I need to make sure of is we all understand the scientific word theory. It is not the everyday use of the word theory where it has become synonymous with the word guess. 
Um, this is not a guess. Uh, the Big Bang theory is a set of observations, or it's, it's, a, it's a scientific idea that has been uh, supported by multiple different scientific observations. Um, and so the Big Bang theory is the leading uh, uh, scientific idea as to the, the, the start of the universe. Um, and then the, in, the, the epoch of inflation where the, the expansion started and then got really big really fast and then kept going uh, at a slower pace. That was not too long after the Big Bang itself. So like a fraction of a second after the Big Bang. So, um, so yeah, Big Bang first, inflation second. So yes, inflation has been around since the start of the entire universe. We can't get away from it no matter what. <laughs> I'm talking monetary inflation. It's always been there. <laughs> um, this is a very, this question made me smile. Um, were you named after Michelle Nichols on Star Trek since no. your mom was a fan? <laughs> no, I wish I was. So her name is Nichelle with, a, with an N to, to her first name. Um, so replace her N with an M and you get my name. No, I, no, I was not. Um, my parents needed an M name. So Marty, Mike, Mark, Mary Sue, and, well, not in that order, but I was, I was the, I was the last one. So they needed an M name. Uh, the sort of joke around the family, well, kind of, um, was well, I arrived early. And so they didn't have my name picked out yet. And they knew it was going to start with an M and they joked, ha ha ha, we'll name her Montana. And so I went home around Christmas. And so the sisters at St. Joseph Hospital in Joliet, they would send the kids who went home around Christmas uh, in a stocking. And so my stocking does not have Michelle on it. It says Montana. So <laughs> there you go. <laughs> now you can see the sense of humor of my family. <laughs> No, I would love to say I was named for Nichelle Nichols. She seems like such a cool lady. So um, I would be honored to be named even in the same breath as her. Um, can you discuss the moon? Have a lifespan of what it is made of? Oh, so just some general stuff about the moon, basically? Yeah. Um, so the leading scientific theory of the formation of the moon was a Mars-sized object uh, hit a glancing blow on the early Earth and a bunch of stuff spewed out and, and then the stuff that splashed out essentially formed the moon. So we did not have a moon when we first formed in our solar system. Um, and so ever since then, the the moon has been getting farther and farther from the earth. It just, it spirals outward. So it um, recedes from the earth at the rate of about an inch and a half a year. Coincidentally, that's about the rate that your fingernails grow. So approximately. Um, and so the moon is made of very similar stuff as the earth because it likely came from the earth. So, um, with possibly some of that early planetesimal thing that ran into us, probably with that mixed in too. Um, so, so yeah, it's it's made of very similar stuff. So if you if you go outside, you pick up a rock, chances are you can find some form of that on the moon. Um, not every rock, but some of them, which is kind of cool to think about. It is kind of cool to think about. Oh, and uh, the moon will not completely f fly away from the Earth. It will get to a point where its outward motion is balanced with the Earth's gravity and the sun's gravity. So it will never recede. Um, not talking about the era of when the sun puffs off, but at least in the, in the near term few billion years, it won't escape from the Earth completely. Okay. Cynthia asks, will planets collide when the galaxy... When the, the, galaxy when the two galaxies joins? collide, probably not, because there, there's lots of empty space in between planets too. It could happen. I'd say the chances of that happening are extraordinarily small, um, because planets are even smaller than stars. 
Um, so yeah, I'd say the chances are really low, really low, okay. probably close to zero. Um, what is the grain on Jupiter? And does that indicate life? Um, more than likely, if, if it was a picture that I showed that might have showed some green, no, that's not indicating life. Um, it is just green being used maybe to enhance a feature a little bit, um, to highlight something. Um, it could also be a chemical reaction, but green, green out in the universe does not necessarily equate to life. It does here. Um, but it doesn't necessarily mean that everywhere. But no, as far as we know, no life, no life in Jupiter. Okay. Um, do your studies influence a belief or non-belief in a divine creation? For me personally? Yes. Or if it, oh, okay. If, um, you, if you feel comfortable answering. I'm, I'm formulating an answer. Um, it was not my scientific studies that caused me to think differently from how I was originally religiously raised. It was not the science that did it. Um, honestly, it was a Bible as literature class in college. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, that was run by a uh, Presbyterian minister, which I think was really fascinating. Um, no, it was not. It was not the science that did it. Um, in fact, uh, there have been a lot of studies that have been done. Most scientists still consider themselves God-fearing, religious. It depends on what moniker you want to attach to it. it depends on the person. But um, this whole battle between religion and science does not actually exist. Um, it does in some very small corners. And it, a lot of times where science is made to seem like it's against religion, and it's not. If you think about it, science, and, I'm, and I alluded to this earlier, science answers how. Religion answers why. And if you think of it that way, you go, well, we're talking about different things. We come at the information differently. And so that's okay. And, and I've, I've worked with colleagues who, um, who are very engaged with religious communities, wanting to help them understand the science viewpoint. And they are themselves very religious people. The Vatican has, has two observatories run by the Jesuits. The, the person who runs the Vatican Observatory is an Italian Jesuit brother who is a PhD astronomer who studies meteorites. If you can't get much more connected <laughs> than that, I don't know what is. Um, so this whole religion science battle is not really there. Um, most, most scientists are still religious people or religious leaning people and they're totally okay with with um with the two worlds they they coexist so um so yeah so me personally it wasn't the science that did it um it, it was it was other stuff so anyway. okay um there have been a couple of questions about um movies uh movies about space okay one person mentioned contact Mm -hmm. my one of my favorites is The Martian. Mm -hmm. um, uh, uh, and there are many others. Do you have any thoughts about any of those movies in terms of scientific accuracy? Um, yeah. One thing we always have to remember with the movie is it's not a documentary being shown on Channel 11. So, right. um, so movies are gonna take license with scientific facts and it just happens to tell a better story. Sometimes you got to fudge stuff. Um, the, the guy who wrote the book, The Martian, absolutely knew that he had to hang his story 
on characteristics of a dust storm on Mars where those characteristics don't actually exist. And so he's like, I'm okay with it. I need my story to go in a certain way. In order to do that, I got to fudge the facts in order to do it. Um, but uh, so scientific accuracy, basically, like I said, it's not a documentary. So it's, it's not something where I, I really get hung up about it. Um, Mm, within reason there's sometimes they it's just maybe science is not portrayed well or they portray a a, a, a conflict between like science or religion or something like that where you go really this doesn't this isn't really the way it works um i got a little hung up with the martian just a little bit on the fact that um, when they were showing landscapes of Mars, as he's driving his, his buggy through different landscapes, it all looked like the desert southwest, where we know what those landscapes look like. They actually could have used the real landscapes. They could have made the computer models and made them look real. That part bugged me a little. I'm like, guys, we could have actually done this. The time it took for them to make them look like the desert Southwest, they could have made them look real. So I oh, got a little hung up on that one. Um, but the movie Gravity, I thought was amazing. Again, some science they absolutely got wrong, but they needed to tell the story in a certain way. Um, but other stuff they got spot on, and it was really neat. I, I really like that movie. Um, I've, I haven't seen it, but I've heard Interstellar is, is pretty good. For some of the science, the the depiction of a black hole in Interstellar is probably the best one you'll ever see uh, anywhere. So, um, so yeah, it's it is what it is. I have to suspend my science brain for a while uh, when I watch a movie, or else I'll get hung up on on the on the sometimes lack of scientific integrity. You just got to have fun with okay. a movie. It's a movie. Absolutely. <laughs> um. Gary asked, did I understand you to say that Alpha Centauri is not the nearest star to us? No, it's not. It's um, Proxima Centauri is one of the smaller stars in that system, and that one is slightly closer. So it's part of that whole system, but Proxima is slightly closer than Alpha. There's okay. also a Beta. I can't remember which one, Alpha or Beta, is the closer of the two, um, but it's Proxima and then Alpha or Beta or whichever one. Okay, um, we're coming up on two hours, so I'm going to make this. Um, You're going to make the executive decision to, <laughs> to close it this out. Will, this will be the last question. Okay. So. <clears throat> um, Faye asks, do you believe there is other life in some other galaxy? Absolutely. 100% I do. Um, I do not believe life has visited here. Um, or other life from someplace else has visited here. I don't believe that. Um, uh, or at least the scientific evidence does not support that. The pyramids were not built by aliens. Um, the Nazca lines in Peru were not spacecraft landing strips. Why in the world would they need landing strips after traveling for, for umpteen whatever light years? Why would you need a landing strip? Um, Anyway, stuff like that. Uh, I don't think life has visited here. Uh, at least I have not seen the evidence to support it. Um, I, I get really annoyed and perturbed when it seems like the only people who are capable of taking video of UFOs or, or uh, spacecraft, alien spacecraft, are people who can't hold their camera steady. <sighs> anyway, um, so it's, uh, but it's, if you take that, there's literally hundreds of billions of galaxies on average with a hundred billion stars, you just do the math and there's got to be life out there somewhere. Um, but we haven't found the evidence of it yet, but maybe it's out there somewhere. This has been so fascinating, Michelle. Thanks. Um, this has been a lot of fun for me too. Good. The, um, there have been so many wonderful compliments coming in oh, thank uh, you. that I <clears throat> will share with you later, but um, 
everybody really, really enjoyed this presentation. Excellent. And that was the goal. Give us a little bit of a distraction from, from, uh, from the news of the day. Show some pretty pictures. Maybe learn some science along and the originally, way. Originally, when Michelle and I were corresponding, I, um, I wanted to hire her for the month of August to do. <laughs> and I went... I need to do my regular job. I can't do that. So no, we'll, we'll you know, try four, again at some four point. Tues, four Tuesdays in August, but we yeah. will that have you back. <laughs> yeah, um, we'll, uh, we'll figure something out for the future. Um, thank you again to Avador Evanston for your generous sponsorship of this program. We are so grateful. Um, it's been a, just a fascinating and delightful afternoon. Well, thank you. Thank you. This has been a lot of fun for me too. Hey, everybody out there, if you're still with me, and I know, wow, there's over 100 of you still with me. Um, stay safe, be well, um, take care of each other. We'll get through this. We'll learn some science along the way. Um, and I hope to see you in person someday. But if not, we have a digital way of doing it. So absolutely. Um, so I look forward to that. Okay, great. Have a great week, everyone. Thank you so much. And we'll talk to you next Tuesday at one o'clock. Bye-bye. Right. Thanks, Wendy. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.